this is basically a use case for a very large customer. Um, their production, I'm sure you are all customers of that large company. I'm not allowed to say who it is because they're not a reference customer yet, but I'm pretty sure you've used them. So I'm going to go through some of the challenges we used to make them go faster with the caching technology. So fundamentally, this is a public company who are all about making money. They want to go faster and they want to do it with less hardware to increase their profits even higher. Last year they made over $10 billion. So this is a global company. Um, they're in basically all countries in the world. I'm pretty sure your customers are fed it um, So they didn't want a science fair project. They've been in production for a couple of years. What they don't want is downtime. What they don't want is surprises. So they don't care how cool or fast it is. They want it to always work. And they want something better than their existing solutions. So just to show of hands, how many of you guys have used Cassandra? You know about it? Okay. Um, MongoDB, Couchbase, Aerospike. So those are technologies they use today. They want something faster and cheaper and more highly available than those technologies. So as I said, yeah, also Redis. So this company is so large, they don't use one of those technologies, they use all of those technologies. They're good technologies, but they've got different sweet spots. Some of them are good for certain things, others are good at other things. So they looked at their applications, they looked at their profile, and they said, of all the technologies out there, which is the best fit? And it wasn't one size fits all. They used Redis for different use cases than Couchbase. So the point being, logically they have an Oracle database. They don't have one Oracle database, they have two of them, high availability, and then the scalability, they have a cluster of them. So this is dumbing it down to the simplest. So there's many, many Oracle databases on the back end that they're sharded. There's many of these caching technologies and a huge number of Tomcat servers, because this is a global thing. So when I say there's lots of servers, I'm not kidding. There's a huge amount of servers involved. But I've dumbed it down to these, these are the fundamental components. So the point being, a request comes in, Based on what the request is, it has a special routing thing that figures out which caching technology it wants to use to serve up the data. If, if something's broken or takes too long, they go directly to Oracle. Currently, the Oracle databases are overloaded. So currently, they have 84,000 concurrent connections. So the Oracle database is only supposed to support 64,000 per server, but they have a special patch to go over. So they've sharded Oracle, so there's a huge number of them. Each individual Oracle database server has 84,000 concurrent connections. So there's a lot of work going on. So the trick with caching is they want the data faster, but they also want to offload work and connections from the Oracle database server so that they're, they're 24 by 7, they can post <coughs> So these are all good technologies. They want it to go faster. They want to do it cheaper, and they want it to minimise downtime. The challenges they have is, you know, the average response time with all those technologies is pretty good. But they are driven by SLAs. What is the 95th percentile latency? What is the 99th? Quite frankly, their bonuses are based on can they meet or exceed those SLAs. So if you do a query that you know takes three seconds, it's still going to work. But those bosses aren't going to get their bonus. So they're very motivated to lower the latency, not just the mean latency, because the mean latency is very good. The extreme cases, the 95th and the 99th percentile, they want it to be faster, more available, and cheaper than what they can get today with huge clusters of Cassandra, Mongo, Couchbase, Redis, and Aerospace. So that's the technical challenge that they gave me. They said basically, can you do caching? Can you do it faster? Can you do it cheaper? I, 
I want to get a bigger bonus, is what we're fundamentally saying. So, a little bit of statistics. <laughs> Who of you understands statistics? Who of you likes it? A little bit? Okay, it's not going to be too complicated. This is just high school stuff, nothing more. But I just want to go through a couple of pictures so you all understand what I'm talking about. Because if I go blah, 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 and if you don't get it, I'm kind of wasting my time. So, real simple, we're talking about distributions and percentiles. This is a, what is that thing? Normal distribution. Okay, so the, the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same. You've got standard deviations, and you've got different percentages of values fitting with each in each of those buckets. So it's the standard deviations, it's the percentile. Well understood concept, doesn't really exist in the real world. That's a normalized distribution. The real world is skewed. Is it skewed to the left or is it skewed to the right? I'm going to be talking about stuff that's skewed to the right because it's latency. Because nothing takes a negative amount of time, nothing takes no time, everything takes some positive amount of time. And it's all about pushing it further to the left so it takes less time. The point being, the mean is not the, the most common value, it's pushed to the right because of the outliers. The outliers push up the mean and they fit the 90th up to 99th percentile. But it's about as complicated as it gets, but it's important. So it's not about the average, it's about the 95th and 99th percentile. So here's just an example of this. This is real, this came from the US Census Department. The values don't really matter. You know, it's about how much people money make. The point is, it's a distribution and it's skewed. The one percentages or the 99th percentile make a huge amount of money. The mean is way less. The point then is the distribution. The red line is the, it's the continuous function. You don't measure everybody. You have buckets. And you look at ranges itself. Okay? The point is that that red curve is being approximated with a whole lot of histograms. In this, this case, the histograms are all of even width. Does that make sense? All right. This is a typical latency curve for a database. It's not symmetrical, it's skewed. It cannot take zero amount of time, it cannot take a negative amount of time. It tends to have a, a mean, and because it's, it's skewed, you're always going to get things off to the right when things are going to stop. So that's a, a pretty typical distribution plot. I'm not seeing what the units are, because it's kind of irrelevant. Pick your favorite database, pick your favorite NoSQL database, pick your favorite caching technology. They all have the same sort of curves. The values are what determines the different technologies. So, over to the extreme right, you've got the 99th and 95th percentile. So this talk is all about moving those 95th percentiles as far to the left as possible to make things go faster. So, we're going to have buckets in the histogram, and for convenience, the buckets are not the same width. The point being, virtually, you know, because you can't have no you know, zero latency. The width of the smallest bucket is wider, likewise with the largest bucket. So the, the width varies based on the sort of expected values you're going to get. Because you've got to measure them, you know, um, it takes up space, so you're doing a measurement and you're putting it in a bucket. If you're putting it in a counter, you put it in a bucket. Does anyone not understand that? So the point being, the, the frequency of values in a bucket gives you the histogram, the histogram approximates a continuous function which is reality. So you handcrafted those bucket size, those bucket ranges is what Ab you're Absolutely. I actually wrote this as part of the product many years ago, <laughs> so that's a detail. But the point is, I didn't invent this, pick your favourite technology, look up papers, everyone doing the same sort of thing. 
Sir. This is the shape of the distribution which this large customer has with Redis, the Cassandra, and you know, um, Mongo and Couchbase and Aerospy. And the values to the right are the problem, the 95th and 99th percentile. They wanted something better. I'm going to cut to the chase. What we got when we used times 10 as a cache was this. Same buckets, it was very skewed to zero, which is a good thing. So the 95th percentile went from 234 milliseconds down to less than one millisecond. The customer was very happy about that. So I'm going to go into the sort of details of what that means and how we achieved it, by the way, with zero code. So, you got questions? Yep. Can you talk about the like, network architecture of this, like where these different elements of the system are what they can Sure, I'll, I'll jump back to quickly address that. This is a cloud. It goes through, you know, firewalls, VPNs, you name it. Eventually it hits, hits. Within their organizations, huge clusters of Tomcat. These technologies are on the same network, basically. They're Oracle database. So the latency as measured is from their app, which goes to um, Tomcat, which goes to the cache and back again. If they get a cache hit, it's a short, short series of hops, if they get a cache miss, it goes all the way back. So they measure it from a client of Tomcat. It's not the cloud, because you know the, the, the time to do that is variable. It's the client within the organization. So if you're near that data center, that's the end-to-end -end latency. If you're a long way away, I in a different country, that extra round trip time. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. There's very different lines of network performance and. Absolutely. I mean, that's physics. I can't change that. So, what we're trying to do is basically, if you ignore the WAN components, it's what the latency is. It's not magic. So, any other questions so far? I said the buckets were on the same loop. Yep. Um, what kind of data are they storing in this uh, database? Um, I can't tell you the customer all the exact data. There was a lot of strings, a lot of numbers, and a lot of dates. Okay. The transaction data or the pricing data? This is, yeah, um, I'd love to tell you. Okay, no worries. Or make it to play. When they're a reference customer, I want to tell you who they are. Until they're a ref reference customer, it will give the game away too easily. Why kind of industry? <laughs> but when I say you're probably a customer, I mean. Are they in Seattle? Oh. <laughs> yeah. usually, usually there are benchmarking data sets, right? Yep. Which, on which most databases are being benchmarked yep. and sort of provides a similar platform, like you don't have to ask what the data is. So yep. do we have numbers like how good that performed on? Absolutely. Um, you familiar with YCSB? Um, just trying to remember your numbers. Come back to me. Um, but I, so there's, there's published numbers from you know Cassandra, Mongo, Redis, like etc. We have the highest published numbers. Off the top of my head, I can't remember this, but I'm sure I'll remember. The distribution would probably still be the same. Same. The distribution would probably be still be similar to what you have. Um, YCSB is incredibly simple. It's a single table, basically doing key lookups. This is doing joins. This is complicated. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So, as I said, um, it's a histogram, you've got buckets. Between naught and roughly 16 microseconds is a bucket. 16 microseconds up to 125 microseconds is a bucket. And then we go to 0 0.001, that's one millisecond. One to eight milliseconds, eight to 64 milliseconds, up to half a second. 
So if things go larger, this large number is ridiculously large. It's just a bucket that, you know, if something goes really wrong, something always lands in the bucket. So the point is, we deliberately chose the buckets to represent the expected values. So this isn't specific to the customer. This histogram is built into the database that we use performance. The point being, we think things should occur less than or equal to 16 microseconds because the database can go faster than that. Okay, so that's, those are the bucket sizes in the histogram. Do you guys understand what that means? Okay. You guys are smart. Most people fit up do not understand this. I talk about distributions and percentiles and they go like, what? <laughs> so the point being, because it's a histogram, we have frequency. So most of the values took 16 microseconds or less. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Anyone not understand that? Okay. So, so if you're doing joins in the memory, yep. uh, it will really <coughs> cache all the database or it will be into in memory. Or how much how much is being cached? Yep. And, and how do you decide what to cache? Yep. And how stale can it get before you update? Those are all excellent questions. So if everything was cached, this would be really simple. They cache as much as they can, but they cannot cache at all. Just because just imagine a new customer came along. If a new customer joins the system, it goes into Oracle. My cache doesn't know about that until I automatically update or refresh my cache. So I don't have a 100% cache at ratio. But what percentage is it of the total? It's 97% cache at ratio. Which means in practice there's 3% cache misses. And if you look at it, some of them are taking more than a millisecond. So it's actually two distributions. It's a distribution for cache hits overlaid with a cache distribution, a distribution for cache misses. So between one millisecond and half a second is the distribution to go to Oracle. The stuff that's all way less than a millisecond is the distribution where we got a cache hit when we go against the memory database. What are the sizes of the memory and the Oracle? Um, Oracle's huge, like big Spark servers. I think the biggest Spark servers. These things are just VMs. Um, Less than half a terabyte. There's lots of them, but the the working set that satisfies 97 percent cache hit ratio for the couple of key tables that they really care about is less than half a terabyte. But that means you're talking about very, very specific use cases. Absolutely. So this is a large organisation. They have many applications. They looked at their hottest thing that they had the most pain point. There's basically four tables. There's a couple of single table lookups, a couple of joins. So if you imagine this thing is so large that you set, you have a, a pattern for reads and a pattern for writes, and you use different technologies for reads and writes. So if you look at the read pattern, which currently gets a bunch of these, you know, the Cassandra, the Mongo, um, we literally replaced, instead of being routed to, you know, Cassandra or Mongo or Couchbase, it's routed to the Chinese cache. So, Imagine there's many applications, incredibly complicated schemas, many tables. They looked at the, the hottest part of their system that's used all the time that was causing them the most grief, where they weren't hitting their SLAs, so they wanted to go faster. So absolutely, it's a subset of the entire system that was the problematic part of the system. So we're not trying to catch everything. They're saying, what is the bottleneck to make that occur faster? Any other questions? So, if you do the math, 87% of the hits were taking 16 microseconds or less. So I, look, I looked at the percentages of each of those buckets, and then just to make life simple, I then added it up. So if you add the first two rows, 98% of the hits were taking 125 microseconds or less which is pretty good. Um, if we had the next row, we're up to over 99%. I don't know, so it's 99.6%. I don't know what the 99 percentile is because I don't have that data. If I had more buckets in Instagram. But it's obviously between those two values. So, the customer was very happy. Their existing 95th percentile was 324 milliseconds. 
I worried for getting any viruses. That was the 95th percentile. The 99.6th percentile was less than one millisecond. So it's a lot faster, and they're getting their bonuses, they're very happy candidates. So I thought I was done. I thought, cool. They wanted to go from 324 down to about 20 milliseconds. We went to less than a millisecond. I thought we're done. And you may have answered this already, but the path is simply Oracle now. It's 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 from the Tomcat server to the Oracle times 10 cache yep. to the Oracle database. Yep. None of those other systems are involved in this path all this work for this data. data. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you so replaced the, all of those systems, not just a subset um, of them? Technically, we've added to it. So we've been in production for about six months now. <coughs> this is a very conservative company. It's a lot faster. Yeah. We're not, we haven't replaced all of those things. They're going to run it for longer. It's another six months, who knows? Eventually, they're going to turn the other ones off. So they can't afford to have mistakes. It's been working great for six months. When their IT is completely confident that there's going to be no issues, they'll turn off the existing you know, sure. stuff. Yeah. At the moment, some of the workload's going to this, some of it's going to the other ones. So it just, it's about risk management. And all of their accesses are hitting the times 10 in a client server mode? Correct. This is client server. Yeah. So most of that time is actually the round trip time from the client to this and that. So they could do even faster if they integrated it. Yes, but in practice, when you've got hundreds of thousands yeah, yeah, yeah. of clients per server, in practice, you need to use client server. Right. Okay. So those are the numbers. How am I going to find? Okay. So I'm now going to tell you how we did it, or well, more specifically, what we didn't do, which was like how we configured things. So that's the actual output if you use the product. It's just command line thing, you get some buckets, not very pretty. We do have a, a GUI with a sticker in it, but that's the real data. Yeah, so as I was saying before, I thought I was done. There's two distributions. The stuff highlighted is the second distribution, which is the cache messages when you have to go to Oracle. For the last couple of months, we've been tuning that. It's not a times 10 problem, it's how can we make Oracle go fast with cache misses and connection pools. We basically need to write our own connection pool because we are automatically updating the cache. Because like if a new customer comes in, that customer isn't in the cache. So we have to say, is there any new inserts, updates, or deletes? If there are, we need to add them. So that's what we call a cache refresh. So we're constantly updating the contents of the cache. So we're always updating the cache if there's a cache miss, we need to go to Oracle. It turns out with that contention, if you get it over 500 cache misses per second, just with our internal data structure, we get a contention. So we rewrote that to make that scale better. Can you get a question? Yes. <coughs> if the cache is missed, does it does the same call wait to refresh? Yes. Or does it, it blocks. We transparently get the data from Oracle, we update the cache and return it. So the round trip time to Oracle is added to it, which is why we're getting some of these things which we're taking between one second and up to half a second. I mean, one millisecond up to a, a second. So they're pretty rare. Roughly 0.3% of the times that was occurring. They wanted to make that particular distribution faster. So that wasn't making times 10 faster, but faster was making getting the cache miss, basically getting the Oracle code. Uh, sometimes it can happen. The customer uh, data is invalid, no longer like some updates might have happened. So uh, how are, how is the delivery handling? Yeah, great question. I'm going to cover that in about six slides. If you just hold that thought. Yeah. Yeah. So the original database is like one key, one friend, or the other blockchain. No, no, no. The original, it's an Oracle database with a schema. Yeah. Um, so it's not key value. It's, yeah. 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 Um, you have lots of indexes because it's not a single access pattern going as the primary key. You can you have to use multiple secondary indexes. Sorry. 
Great question, hold on to that, I've got a slide for that. So that question makes a lot of sense if you're using a NoSQL database. Because you're using a relational database that can have a set of indexes, you can have fast accesses on non primary key accesses. Great question, just hold on and have a look. So, how do we do it? The cache is an in memory database. That in memory database just happens to be a relational SQL database called Times 10. So, Times 10 is a database, and we turn on a feature which says you're actually a cache rather than a system of record. About half of our customers use Times 10 as a standalone system of record. The other half use it as a read-write cache in front of the model database. So, use a really fast technology for your cache. <coughs> because you're caching data from Oracle, you're caching relational data. So you've got tables, you've got relationships, you have hierarchies. Is it, is it one to many, to many, to many, to many? It's as complicated as you want to be. The point being, you don't cache everything. You figure out the hot tables, you cache the hot tables. So you're caching a subset of the tables. If you look at those tables, you don't have to cache all the columns. You cache the subset of the columns that you care about. And also you don't have to cache all the rows. You cache the subset of the rows. So it's the hot tables, the hot columns, the relevant rows. So you could have terabytes or zottabytes of disk and where your back end system is, in this case Oracle. But you can be caching that and only gigabytes because you're not caching everything. Subset of the table, subset of the column, subset of the rows. And you can dynamically change that. And I'll show you how to do it. Um, the other thing is you don't do dumb things. You've got an in memory database. It happens to be SQL, it happens to be relational. All the things that you would do with a normal relational database. Is it, is it Oracle, is it MySQL, is it SQL Server, is it PD2? They're all the same. You prepare and bind your SQL. Do not use dynamic SQL if you want to go really fast. You compile your SQL. Use the relevant indexes. Don't do crazy joins. <laughs> Our teaching products do not go fast. Um, Times 10 uses a cost-based optimizer, so you've got to have up-to-date statistics. And once you've done all that, look at the stats to see where the bottleneck is and check. So none of that's rocket science. If you don't do that, it won't go fast. So do basic tuning. There's also some hardware. Um, you know, the customer had one slow disk because it cost less memory, I mean less money. I said if you use two disks or an NVMe disk, it will go faster. And we did lots of benchmarks and lots of comparisons. And instead of spending any more money, they got us to make our product go faster because they didn't want to spend more money. Good thing. How much of that is in code and how much do people you know, configure? Zero code. You configure and I'll show you how. So I'm running out of time, so we have lots of customers. SQL database runs in memory, still persists with this. So Simple primary key lookups take less than two microseconds on five-year-old hardware. So current Intel Xeon's a Skylake, before that was Haswell, before that was Broadwell. So five years ago, using Broadwell setting the network, the only thing left to wait for was the CPU. So the faster the CPU gigahertz cycles, and the larger the ultimate cache, the faster your memory database can go. So even with five-year-old Xeon's, pretty fast. If you've got a, you know, a 99 gaming machine you overclocked, it's really crazy how fast you can go. But you don't run those in data centers because they cost too much. Data centers have cheap machines. So the point being, with a really well tuned Oracle database, you can get selects in about 100 microseconds, which is pretty good. Updates you can do in less than a millisecond if you've got good hardware. These are histograms. The darker ones is the latency of times 10. It's less. So this benchmark was the same schema, the same data, the same JPC code, exactly the same. The only difference was the connect script. That's just a generic example. What I've been showing you prior to that was a specific customer example. How is the update factor? You're updating 
and memory data structures and it's synchronously writing into Tessa. It's still asynchronously. And you wait until it writes. No, it's asynchronous. So you're not waiting. Asynchronously write to Tessa? Asynchronously. Because you do it asynchronously, there's a window where you might have committed to memory that hasn't hit Tessa. But if you lose the memory. Exactly. So if you have multiple machines, it turns out you can write to another machine over the network faster than you can write to Tessa Mouse. So we do asynchronous writes, and in parallel, we, we do that update, you know, that write over the wire to another machine. That's how we can do fast updates. So low latency plus high load data volume. So what is the protocol for writing so that you know more it's for sure it's updated? It's called synchronous writes. Yeah, but you're not waiting for it, right? So the time is much shorter. The, the purple, is the one that where you have to wait for the synchronous light. The amber is where you don't wait for the synchronous light. So, so just to be clear, when we're doing writes and we want to guarantee it's occurring, we have two methods. We can asynchronously write to one machine, the local machine, and synchronously write to another machine. When the asynchronous acknowledgement has come back, we can go on continue. That's method one, that's the fastest way. The second way is to synchronously write to disk, fastest disks in the new disks. They can do it in a bunch of microseconds. Um, you know, if you've got the fastest end you need, it's sort of a, a race between that and the, the network speed. Mm -hmm. The point is that we could either with persistently writing to disk or asynchronously writing to another machine. Either way, we can do it in a bunch of microseconds. There are any scenarios where you have a sequential write for the same record? Um, so you have update, one update and then second update for the same subscriber. Absolutely. So, um, we can get off, off track here. This is trivial stuff where the operations tend to be, say, one write. Most applications are far more complicated than that to do a write followed by another write. It's means sequential. Sequential's got nothing to do with synchronous or asynchronous. So, I just want to, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. I'm going over my time. Okay, okay. Right. This cutting is this. Acknowledge time, which we cannot do. So fundamentally, you've got some data model on Oracle, you represent it in times 10. You're not caching all tables for subset. You've got the same table names, same schema names, and the same relationships. You can have different indexes on times 10 than you can on Oracle. Change Changes, inserts, updates, or deletes, we poll and we get a batch. You can poll as frequently as every 100 milliseconds. For the writes, you do it in parallel, and it's still going to the order. So the point being, we declaratively say which tables, which columns, which rows, and how often you refresh. Yep. How often you go off? Can you repeat the question? I can't hear. Yes. Um, the problem as it is today, you cache it on one machine. Just bear with me. There's nothing stopping you either caching the same data over many machines, if it all fits in memory, or partitioning your data. We have customers that do both. So we're about to add caching where we use a distributed database. So in that case, some rows are on some machines and some are on other. So that's the distribution, call it the hash distribution. But today, either the data all fits in one machine, and you can have more machines for high availability, or if it doesn't all fit in one machine, customers manually shard their data. Some rows are there in one machine, some are in another. Now, if you feel like um, Currently, that's the application's responsibility. If you partition, reads are in this range, and writes are in this range. But if there's over, overlapping rows, there is a problem. Yeah. You understand? So, so that's not on that side. Yeah. So currently, the way customers solve that is they either use logic in one machine, or they partition their data to avoid that problem. You have to partition. Yeah. Well, when partition, yeah, so excellent question. That's, yeah, no, that's, that's the key 
linked to the easy rights to have for the reasons you're talking about. Okay, so how does all this magic work? We use SQL. You use SQL to define the tables, the columns, and the types, and where clauses. So by defining, yep. So by defining the table, so you're going to cache a set of tables. Cache group caches one or more tables. You can have multiple cache groups. So you're defining the tables, the subset of the columns, and by using the where clause, the subset of the rows. The cache schema or the cache depends sort of on the hotspots in your data, right? Absolutely. The columns and the rows. So, I am, and I thought that is determined dynamically through the statistics or we need to. Define. Okay, so there's two different things. Yeah. Which are the hot tables? Which are the hot columns? Um, quite often the DBA knows that. Okay. We have tools and utilities to figure that out. Figuring that out is independent of. Update. No, once you've defined the tables, columns, and rows of interest, that is independent of inserts, updates, or deletes have occurred on Oracle, and we want those deltas. It has no refreshing. So, so it, it, be, yeah, it can be any any column, it just happens that you yep. can one. Any column. So, I just showed you text wise using a script how to do it. We've also got GUIs to, to do it in a point and click. Is when you type it in by hand or use a GUI to generate. In this case, it's a read only cache group. In this case, it's auto refreshing every five minutes. Whether it's five minutes or one minute or three seconds or 100 milliseconds is something that you choose on a business need. Um, it's going to automatically refresh it and specifying the tables and columns you care about. So the point is, you're not writing a huge amount of code to figure out what to cache. The DBA declares it. So if you've got an app which uses SQL to read from your Oracle database, that same SQL is going to change. You connect to the times 10 cache into the Oracle database directly. Because it's the same schema, it's going to the same tables, with the same column names. A select that went against Oracle will also work against the times 10 cache, can't be changed. You change the connect string, you don't change the SQL. So if you get a JDC or an OCI or a .NET program, you don't even need to recompile. You just change the next string. Here's an example where it's a hierarchy with employees and job history tables. So you can have arbitrary compile rate. Yep. So, so okay. it's going to be quick. I've got this in a minute. Okay, go ahead. I can answer it. Okay. Do you have a Q&A as well? Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm going for the last three slides. So the point is, we've got one technology and two products. The product is called Times 10, which is a standalone system, which you can use for OLT, Google Analytics, and you can use it as a scale-out database, which this guy used to work for us. He was our dev director, smart guy. Talk to him afterwards. Or that same technology has got a different name, different license for caching, <coughs> for application via database cache, which is a bit of a mouthful. It's a feature of the Oracle database. It is times 10. These are a standalone product. So, in summary, you can do cloud scale read write caching <coughs> with 99th percentile of less than one release. So, I've been talking about one particular customer, converted with the telco, same sort of thing, same sort of latency. For all this sort of things, we have found no evidence that times 10 is not faster than all other competition. It's lower latency, better 99th percentile, and you don't need to write any code for the cache. You can declaratively define the behavior. So it's fast. So the point being, the customer who had all these free open source products paid us a huge amount of money because they could go faster, be more highly available, and they didn't have to maintain the glue code to do the caching. So they paid us some money, they were happy to do that because they got bigger bonuses because they couldn't do estimates. Yep. So they paid money essentially for the glue code, right? We wrote the glue code so they didn't have to. So it's actually 
Technically, it's not zero code, no code. There is that's, code. The good that's code. a fact. We sell them a product, a black box, you can figure out. We have lots of glue code. And yeah. you have to write, you, you define the character of the SQL to give the behavior of what's cached, read only, or read write. And there are two parts to that glue code. One is the routing for reads, and then the connection change, uh, change in the driver right, to push the reads, push the new customer yep. to the right side. Yep. So I've run the time. I'm happy to answer questions after Akmal's talk. Excellent questions. I think you guys understand. Thank you for your time. So, and in terms of winning the prize, you've got to be here to win it. Okay? If you leave early and your name gets called, sorry guys, you know, we just put a lot of name out of the time. So. <laughs> Great. Alright, so, let's just get the uh, HDMI. Thank you. Tatiana, you mentioned there we need to be out here by 8. So, okay guys, so <laughs> I will do my very best, okay, to make this reasonably short. Okay, got a couple of demos, and I think some of you have got questions for Doug as well, so we need to allow a little, little bit of time for that. She needs to do the draw as well, so uh, thank you very much, and it might be a case of people get to take away a pizza as well, so, uh, you know, we've got over, over subscribe. All right, so um, this presentation then will focus a little bit, uh, slightly different take, okay? So Doug described one approach in terms of working with, uh, uh, in terms of the time span, caching, <coughs> very fast technology. Uh, those of you who are regulars at these IMC meetups, you'll know that I've, I've covered pretty much uh, everything in terms of uh, Ignite previously. So we talked about the SQL interface, we talked about uh, machine learning, um, other capabilities as well. So one of the things that is kind of useful is the streaming aspect, which we don't do very often. And so there is a uh, Confluence certified connector, which is now available to allow you to do streaming. Okay, and uh, kind of quick demo to show you. Point us to a couple of articles that are published on DZone, which I did not so long ago. And uh, again, all this stuff you can download and you can try it out for yourself. Okay, so that's the uh, the key thing. Always work getting some hands-on experience for yourselves. <laughs> All right, so the agenda, fairly short then. Ignite and Grid overview, very, very briefly. Uh, then we focus on the uh, streamers ecosystem, uh, talk a little about the integration, and do a quick demo for you, and hopefully leave some time for some Q&A as well. Okay. So um, my role at uh, Grid Game and the reason why I was actually hired was to really focus a lot on the open source Apache Ignite, okay, which is free. Um, Ignite.apache.org. So you can go there, download the source, download the binary, um, lots of uh, useful stuff in terms of uh, case studies. Uh, there is uh, links to the community, dev, and uh, user mailing list. Uh, 
I think Ignite is amongst the top five Apache projects in that respect. These are numbers published by Apache. Uh, however, you know, Grid Game, the company, uh, it's like the kind of Red Hat model. You know, essentially the software is free, but if you want some enterprise services and some uh, other features as well, then of course come to Grid Game. These are paid for type services. So Ignite, memory-centric, distributed database, caching and processing platform. So it does some of the stuff that Doug was talking about as well. You know, uh, historically where it's come from is as an in-memory data grid. Does more now, okay? So it can do persistence, for example. It can, it can be a system of record, treated as a distributed SQL database. It does machine learning. Um, it does transactions, okay? It will work uh, uh, very effectively with uh, third-party systems as well. So if you've got an investment in, say, MySQL or Postgres or Oracle, it will happily work as a cache uh, for these uh, systems as well. And in fact, yesterday, Tatiana and I were just at the uh, MySQL uh, user group where we did exactly that. Uh, Gridgain, however, takes that and adds a little bit more on top of it. So, memory-centric platform based on Apache Ignite, adding enterprise features and support for mission-critical deployments. So in the case where you really need some enterprise-type support, bug fixes, training, all of those kind of things, as I said before, the Red Hat type of model, then you come to us, okay? These are paid for services. Mm -hmm. But in general, we'll try to focus as much as we can on the open source. At a very high level, as you uh, Americans say, you know, the uh, 30,000 foot, 50,000 foot view of uh, the architecture of uh, Ignite. So everything on the left-hand side you see there in the uh, kind of orange and red and uh, black and white, all of this is open source, it's free, okay? <laughs> this is what you get with the free uh, um, uh, from uh, the Apache website. A couple of blue bars on the right-hand side there, uh, these are type of the enterprise type of services. Okay, so data snapshot and recovery, think of that as a little bit like um, in terms of uh, you know, what database management systems tend to do, uh, point in time type of recovery, monitoring and management, security and auditing, much better, and uh, data center replication. So there are customers out there using some of these capabilities, and one of the largest customers of this technology is Spurbank. So they've got three huge data centers around the world where they do uh, exactly that in terms of replicating the data, ensuring that you know if there is a disaster in one of them, it gets knocked out. You know, power outage, asteroid, or some natural disaster that at least they can keep uh, the business running. Um, so we've, uh, as I said before, covered a lot of these um, capabilities in past presentations. So really, we're focusing on the streaming today, which is uh, one of the things that uh, tends to get. Uh, missed in a lot of pre previous presentations. Um, we don't need to say too much about some of these other aspects, but uh, again, just to emphasize the memory-centric storage, okay? So historically, where Ignite has come from is this class of technology referred to as an in-memory data grid. Um, it's been around for quite a long time. So there are other in-memory data grids as well, Oracle Coherence, for example, you might be familiar with, Hazelcast, some other open source and uh, uh, commercial products as well. Okay, um, so one of the kind of uh, approaches uh, in terms of uh, utilizing some of the streaming capabilities is that if we look in terms of the type of architecture that a lot of organizations uh, are kind of requiring nowadays, previously in terms of ETL, separate data warehouse and operational database, different sort of mix in terms of capabilities and what we want to uh, uh, run, um, and what grid game tries to do is really combine a lot of those capabilities together. So it's real-time processing, machine learning, um, analytics, transactions. Uh, it's scalable because it's just add more resources. Horizontal scalability, okay? You can uh, uh, grow and shrink your uh, cluster as you need it to meet your demands. Okay. Um, overall then, in terms of the uh, Ignite sort of streaming approach, well, it works a little bit like this, okay? So we have this concept of Ignite Streamer. So Ignite happily integrates and has connectors and adapters for a whole bunch of streaming technology. So if you're using things like Spark Streaming, for example, Flink, Kafka, all of these things, there are connectors and adapters for those. No point in having that capability built in Ignite itself, it's reinventing the wheel, okay? Someone else has already done a good job, so why not utilize those capabilities? And uh, today we'll focus on Kafka. So there is a little bit more information about this, but essentially what we can do, we can parallelize the operations, data can be read and parallel into our cluster, and then once it's there, of course, then we can execute queries, which again can be parallelized. Okay, so we're using the power of the cluster, we're able to use the parallelism uh, to be able to get back results much faster than otherwise. 
And I've touched upon a couple of these already, so I've mentioned some of these technologies. So various streaming technologies. Uh, lots of this is documented on the Ignite uh, website of Apache, Kafka, Sparkling, Storm, Processed Image, and Push to Ignite. Okay, so there's a whole range of capabilities that we can do. So as we're streaming that data, it can be enriched. Okay, so we've got examples that uh, uh, code examples published on GitHub, for example. So if you integrate with Spark, for example, Spark can do some enrichment, can enhance data somehow, we can stream that back into Ignite. Ignite can act as a sync and do some additional processing there as well. So there's a kind of a, 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 a new stack that we can uh, use for this type of processing. Ignite is a final store for streaming data. So think of it as a sync, okay? So as a, as a destination where the data can be streamed in, can be stored. Um, and you can do other things as well. So things like complex event processing. Okay, you can define windows. You can say, all right, I'm interested in the last five minutes worth of data, or I'm interested in the last 10 events, or something like that. Very per uh, you know, perfectly capable to do that. Um, and the other thing is that you can decide what you want to do with that data, whether you want to just read it in, you know, if it's a continuous stream, process it, <coughs> get rid of it, or if it needs to be stored for longer term, you can do that as well. Um, a little bit more in terms of the API, then. That's, we briefly touched upon this a couple of slides ago. So partitioning of streams of data, Ignite Streaming Powerhouse. Okay? So the Ignite Streamer can manage this process of dividing up the data for you uh, into the cluster. Stream receivers and transformers, last four updates, <coughs> announced, it means that there's a whole bunch of additional capabilities that we can do. Um, and we can, you know, again, treat it as a sync or process sort of continuous queries, or it can be finite. Um, there's other types of capabilities that we can do in terms of, uh, you know, do we want to send some type of notifications, for example, once some operation is completed. Uh, either we process the data and then we can send out these notifications. These are, again, perfectly possible. Again, refer you to the documentation for this. Okay, let's drill down a little bit then into the actual Kafka connector then. Okay, so this is something um, that was announced not very long ago, okay, so this is something that was done in conjunction with Confluent, it's certified by Confluent, uh, supported by Gridgame, has a whole bunch of capabilities, so there is an open source solution as well, not as capable as obviously a commercial solution, which uh, Gridgame would obviously like you to buy and uh, be able to use, but what the commercial solution provides is a whole bunch of capabilities that you don't see in the open source solution. So you can actually implement this yourself if you want to. You know, it's maybe a couple of hours worth of work if you really want to do it. Um, but this thing goes far beyond that. Okay, so the open source solution is perfectly possible, gives you some capability, um, but this really builds upon that and goes uh, much, much further. So, a whole bunch of features that you can see in terms of publish, subscribe, scalable, fault tolerant, real time, persistent, uh, mostly written in Scala. Okay, I think this is for uh, uh, various uh, um, sort of support reasons. Um, Graphically, then, in terms of the uh, uh, architecture and the approach, it can be something like this, okay? So this is a high-level view in terms of the, cap the connector. Um, now, notice here, for example, that uh, we can have a situation where Ignite, grid game can be the source, or it could be the sync. And then we can have any Kafka-enabled data source, any Kafka-enabled data sync, and a combination of these uh, can work either way. So the, the demo that I'll show you today very quickly is actually going to use uh, MySQL over here. Um, and uh, we've got uh, Grid Game uh, running as well. So uh, and, uh, again, we can switch this around the other way as well. Um, one of the things that uh, Ignite provides is, is this ability to work with third-party stores. So uh, caching, I touched upon this a little bit earlier on. Um, one thing to remember is that the way that Ignite works and its caching capability works with third-party storage is that essentially you're reading the schema and the information from your third-party system. Ignite recreates that data in memory. It operates on those uh, uh, the data that you have in memory. It can do updates. It can do queries. If data have changed in memory, it can push those changes back uh, to the storage, third-party storage, you know, MySQL, Postgres, whatever. However, Meantime, if the, any changes have occurred within your database system, Ignite doesn't see them. It doesn't work that way. Okay? For that, you need some kind of third-party solution, such as uh, Oracle. Um, um, I think it's Golden Gate. Uh, Doug, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the solution there. Or you can actually do it using this, Kafka. Okay? So it's published and subscribed. So you can have, for example, your database system over here uh, sends out um, 
know, information about the updates and changes, which can be read on the other side as well. So that's perfectly possible, a solution that could work uh, in this kind of scenario. Um, okay. A little bit more then. So um, we talked about the parallelism. Uh, now, the way that if you know anything a little bit about Kafka, the, kind of got asked, you know, how does it do transactions? How does it guarantee that operations are, are already done? Well, this exactly one's processing semantics is the, the uh, approach that we use. Um, single connector for multiple caches, topics, filtering of sources in connectors, enterprise ready. So as I said before, it's supported by contain, certified by Confluent, and uh, really it goes far beyond the, just the open source sort of capability that uh, uh, you could implement yourself. Okay, so diving straight in then, let me just show you an example of this working. Okay, because I appreciate that uh, we are in the stretch of time and uh, you know, it needs to uh, draw as well. Okay, so let's just start. I have to open a couple of these terminal windows. Let's just see how big this is. Can I uh, blow this up? Yeah, that's great. That will work. All right. So. Let's use my SQL, okay? Okay, okay, that seems to be running already, that's fine. Put this down, and we can uh, have a look at this. I use uh, the community edition, okay, just to uh, have a look at the database system. And we can have a look at uh, what database we've got available. Uh, again, I'll go down and give you a little bit of a look at this. So there is this system here. Okay, grid gain, Kafka, MySQL. Okay, I previously created this. Now at the moment there's no table here. It should be empty. Yeah, which is correct. That's fine. So there's a little bit of sort of prep work that I've done. Okay. Now, we need to open uh, a fair number of these uh, terminal windows because I have to run a bunch of stuff. Some of it is Kafka related, Zookeeper and other things as well. Some of it is Ignite related uh, as well. So bear with me, okay? So I'll talk you through the steps. Now, because I've got fat fingers and I can't type well, I've got a cheat sheet, which I'm gonna copy from, okay? <laughs> so there we go. All right, so we've done that, right? So the next thing to do is we'll fire up uh, grid gain. Okay, so this is just a simple uh, step. Just uh, define the grid gain home variable. Okay, just point to the installation directory. That's it. I mean, it's just a zip file. Just unpacked it and uh, it's there. And then again, the way that we launch this, uh, here I'm passing a configuration to this particular instance. It just picks up some information locally and it's a way that the, you know, for example, um, Ignite or Regain servers can find each other. So there's a couple of ways. Static IPs, multicast, we can define the range of addresses and port numbers that we need. It's all XML. Okay, very, very simple. It comes pre-configured with a whole bunch of stuff that you can use, or you can define your own. So that's fine. Okay, so let's launch that. Just needs Java. Okay, so hopefully that will uh, boot us up something. There we go. So, so far we've got MySQL running. We have um, and ignite, we gain node server up and running as well. Okay, now, one of the ways that we can have a look at, um, let's just get myself a, a new shell window. As I said before, I'm gonna need a couple of these. There we go. Uh, there is a, a kind of a web interface, which is uh, kind of nice in terms of being able to run notebooks, run simple queries, for example. Uh, but in order to use that, I mean, it's a REST-based interface, we have to have this web agent running locally. Okay, so it's again, just a, a very simple download. All it's going to do, I'll run this, okay. And let me just zoom in and again show you. So notice here we've got console.gridgame.com set up as the default, okay, and in the fact, down at the bottom there, it's found one server node which is running on this uh, laptop, which is fine, okay, we can have additional ones as well if we want, but one that is sufficient for our uh, demo purposes. Um, a word of caution, 
Uh, I'm using this console.gridgame.com. Now, obviously, that's running on Grid Games' website. Right? If you want to use this, you can download this and build it locally, host it behind your own firewall, which is the recommended approach. For simple demo purposes, and because I happen to be a grid game employee, for me it's okay, all right? But for, you know, if you want to uh, use this for your own environment, I would highly recommend that you uh, um, think a little bit more carefully about how you're going to do that. <coughs> okay, so there we go. Now, we can connect to the R cluster, and uh, there we go, console.gridgame. And this provides us with a number of sort of capabilities. Okay, so we've got sort of queries, there is notebooks that you see I've been working on previously, there's some monitoring tools, dashboard for example, gives me some information and statistics, CPU usage, heap size of the cluster. Not very useful at the moment since I've only got one node running, but you know, over time the numbers would accumulate. Further down, I've got some additional information in terms of uh, you know, what, uh, persistent storage, caches, and so on, services. Again, it's okay, most of these, as you can see, are empty because there's not much activity there, and I'm not utilizing anything in particular. That's absolutely fine. Okay. Now, one of the things that we've got here is this uh, ability to use some uh, notebooks. And I've previously set this one up. Okay, so here you can see. Standard SQL. <coughs> okay, so. so this is going to do a simple sort of create table, and we're going to enter in a couple of values, right? Just uh, can be as complex as you like. SQL 99 is what is the level of uh, SQL that's supported there. So we can execute this. Okay. Uh, this will create a table. Uh, good question. So the gentleman's asking, where does this create the table? So I'm issuing this create table statement. Where is it going to happen? This is going to happen in my grid game cache. Okay? Right? So remember, I've got a server running, grid game, or ignite, okay? doesn't matter. For our purposes, I'm using the commercial version. Okay? So the server is running. I run this statement, it will create a table in that cache at the moment. Okay? And I can show you. Okay? We can scroll back to monitoring. Okay? And again, remember, this is giving us some insights into our cluster, our grid game or ignite cluster. Okay? So we work with either. And if we scroll down, there we go. And notice here, okay, just let me just open that up a little bit. If you can see that SQL public person. Okay, so this is the uh, table that I just created. And if you look on the uh, on the other side there, it says primary. Okay, I just created two rows within that. Um, I can create backups as well. Okay, so good practice in a distributed system have at least one backup. But in this case, not required. Okay, it's not the point of the, uh, of the demo. So this is now in cache, okay? There's no connection between this and MySQL or anything else at the moment, okay? So all I've done is created a simple cluster, one machine, which is just fine. Yes, question? This is Grid Game or this is Ignite? So it doesn't really matter. So um, I'm using the commercial version, okay? Uh, which is, uh, I think on my laptop, the ultimate version. Um, if you use Ignite, it will work the same. Okay. Now, the reason I'm using Grid Game is because the Kafka connector happens to be some sort of commercial offering, so it works with the commercial version of Grid Game. Um, like yourselves, if you want to download the commercial version of Grid Game, it's a simple form that you fill in. They'll give you a link to download it. Yeah, I think you can use it for up to 30 days. After that, you can still launch a cluster, but it will stop after an hour. Okay? I'm in the same boat as you. Okay, so I don't have any extra licensing or any capabilities, so it's going to run for an hour for me and then it's going to stop, which is fine. Okay, we don't need uh, that much time. But equally, if I was running Ignite, I'd get the same results here so far. Okay, there's no difference in terms of doing that. Okay, great question, by the way. Great, uh, yeah, we, we, it's important that we uh, kind of differentiate there. So that's fine. Everything is running fine so far. Let's go a little bit further then. Okay, so we've uh, created the table. Now let's do a little bit of sort of Kafka stuff. Okay, so for, for Kafka, there's a whole range of uh, steps that we need to take. And again, I have to open up a couple of more of these uh, shell windows because there's a whole bunch of stuff I need to run, Kafka server, Zookeeper, and so on, in order to get that uh, up and running. Okay, and these are just following the instructions from Confluent in terms of what we need to do to get this working. Okay, so there's Zookeeper. That's working fine. Okay. And we need to do a little bit more here. Oh, sorry, wrong window. As I told you, I'm all thumbs. There 
have to go. Need yet another window, shell window to launch that, a separate, separate space. I think I can leave them on there next time. Okay, there we go. There's a bit of that got running there. That's fine. So you see quite a few sort of processes that we've got going so far, but so far there's no kind of still no interconnection between Kafka and what we have stored in uh, with Gate. So now we're going to address a few errors in that console. <coughs> oh, these are warnings. Don't worry. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, have you worked with Java? <laughs> okay. You know. Um, it's doing its job, okay? So it's essentially, it's warning you. If you look, it's info, info, info. Don't worry, right? It's, it's nothing window. catastrophic. Yeah, um, no, I think it's yeah, the yeah. window behind us. Uh, error uh, path. Okay. Okay. Er, there we go. There we go. Error path admin. Yes. There we go. As long as it doesn't crash, it's fine, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking the default. You would take the opportunity to configure this properly, okay? I'm just showing you what's possible just straight out of the box. I mean, that's that's the goal there. It's very resilient. All right, there we go. <laughs> so it's running. The important thing is working, all right? There we go. All right, so yeah, show window now. All right, hopefully, fingers crossed, there we go. All right, now watch this one carefully, okay? So you see, big one, there you see, big nine. Okay, so that is the actual integration. That's the connector that's now now running, okay? So, finally, after all those steps, getting Zookeeper running, Kafka running, now the connector's up and running, what's happened now is our cluster, with game cluster, is now connected to the MySQL, okay? And that table we created, plus the two rows that we uh, uh, added into the cache, if we now switch back to Dbeaver, and uh, here, do a refresh, I take a moment or two, hang on. Okay, try again. Okay, give it a moment, one more go. Yes, yes, go ahead. So when the is going to stream far, yes. so I have like a stream problem. I'm finding me that I want to come. Yes. I have the stream. So I have like a few things that Apache is far. Yes. Uh, how do you choose between one or the other for streaming far? Uh, okay, so the, the gentleman is asking in terms of streaming. Um, so a common question that comes up is that people say, okay, we're using Spark streaming, for example, or we're using some. Choose? Those pros and cons are Yes, I, I think that's a tough one, um, because in terms of Ignite, it, it, it's generally, I mean, it's not a streaming technology per se. It doesn't do the streaming itself. What it does is happily integrate with other streaming engines um, in terms of, uh, you know, they do the job far better, but Ignite can act as a sync. It's a, a way to be able to get the data in to Ignite very, very quickly. Yes, yeah, so the, the goal is that if you're working, um, and remember, Kafka is developed by Confluent, and the technology was developed at LinkedIn, so it's pretty robust. I mean, it's reliable, it does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in, in this case, for example, um, if we have lots of data that we want to be able to get into Ignite, be able to process it, for example, it could be real-time uh, information, transactions, for example, or it could be IoT-type data, or maybe we've got wearables, you know, the sensors are sending lots of data in. Um, we can... You know, stream that data into Ignite as a sync. We can process that data. We can run queries on that data. We can do analytics, for example, machine learning. There's a whole range of things we could do. And again, we can define things like conflict event processing, exactly as you said before, uh, a window so to say, look, we're interested in sort of five minutes worth of data, or we're interested in sort of the last sort of 100 events or something like that, you know? It's perfectly possible. So think of Ignite in that sense as, if we're continuous streaming, it, it's perfectly doable, okay? We can, uh, run um, those type of uh, capabilities, or if it's just sort of a one-time uh, effort, we can again do that. So in this case, I Ignite is not trying to replicate streaming, what other engines do very well, but it's acting as a sync, as a, as a way to be able to channel information into uh, an Ignite cluster to be able to uh, utilize it. 
attach the PDF to the front capability. Okay, does that kind of answer your question? Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. I can ask you. Uh, okay, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, okay, my apologies, guys. I think that, as you rightly pointed out, the error was not a warning. Yeah, there was. A, I think there was something, some problem here. Uh, it's, it's my fault. That's oh, okay. It's okay. No worries. Uh, sorry? Yes, so what I was trying to do was um, uh, you know, refresh this and what which should have happened. I have a question. Yes. Does the non tables create my sequence as a cache or does my sequence tables as this image? No, what happens is uh, Doug, so Doug was asking, you know, what, what, what's the actual arrangement here? You know, what, what's this kind of scenario? So what tends to happen is that through the Kafka, what should have happened is that the request that I made in terms of the table that I created, the values that I created, should have gone through the connector, connected to my SQL, and created those for me. Right? That's what, what was actually happening. So it's using Kafka to be able to do that capability, okay? Um, okay, so again, I'm conscious of time, so all right, let, me, let me just uh, uh, kind of move on from there. Thank you very much. Great question, uh, Doug. Uh, all right, so since we need to be out of here, all right, let's uh, just show you a couple of uh, examples of uh, this uh, exact scenario, which uh, I've documented, okay? So on Dizo, uh, do a search on my name, okay? So what I've tried to demo for you I've written it up step by step here. Okay, some of the graphics you'll notice are very similar. All of the steps in terms of configuration. There's some property files. Okay, so the connector itself is configuration driven. No code. You don't have to write code. Okay, you just put some properties in. You define what sort of capabilities you want, and again, it will pick those up from the environment. And uh, then you start your grid game cluster. Okay, so there is a configuration file that's defined there for you. Okay, use that one. And the rest of it is just step by step, again, as we showed you, to be able to uh, just uh, run those things. And again, from the MySQL database side, it should be able to refresh and pick up the, uh, uh, the changes that have come through via Kafka, Kafka Connector, um, and so on. And uh, we should be able to do additional. Now, the one sort of thing here, again, just point, point out here. So the thing is that in this scenario, as you can see, um, there's a couple of different ways that we can use it. Uh, this particular example uses this approach, but there's nothing to prevent you from switching them around the other way, okay? So it could be the relational system on this side, from what we over there, or any Kafka-enabled data source, okay? So it's flexible enough to work with other, uh, other systems as well. Um, one other kind of extension of this, if you're interested, is that you can run this stuff in the cloud, okay? So that works pretty well. So uh, you can create an account on confluent.cloud, okay? Gridgame.cloud, and it can be configured, but this is an example using temperature data, for example, where we are generating sort of um, publishing, you know, with a producer creating some temperature data. It's being consumed on the grid game cloud, and uh, we're then we can run some types of SQL queries on this. Okay, so just doing some things like here, yeah, latitude, longitude. Okay, so these are sensors uh, with some random sort of generated data. But the, the key point here is again, kind of drawing upon what Doug was saying that there's SQL relational systems perfectly capable of doing these types of complex queries. Okay, and they can work really well. Uh, a grid game cloud, you can create. Uh, there is um, uh, a free tier that you can use as well, which I did for this particular demo. Again, it, it, it kind of utilizes the uh, uh, in-memory computing in a cloud-based environment, which I think is pretty useful. Um, keep in mind, though, that the technology, it doesn't offer everything that the uh, uh, downloadable version uh, provides. So it's really a, an initial kind of offering. I think over time it will get better, but it will certainly do things like persistence, for example, um, and you can do things like this. So it happily connects to Kafka. Uh, you know, you can use the connector. So you can take two different cloud environments, which happen to be talking to each other using this particular example. So that's perfectly usable. Okay. All right. Yes, I think you had a question. Do you know what's the difference between Gridman and Monte Arrow? Is it that Arrow is more for in-memory like, data frames? 
how, how do I, I, I'll be honest with you, I've heard about it, but I've not seen it in the context of Ignite. So I don't, it's not something I think we, we, we come across very often within the Ignite community. But again, um, one of the things that I found is certainly with a lot of these Apache projects, there tends to be some overlap between them. Okay? And then sometimes there's a little bit of confusion as well. So sometimes, for example, people look at Ignite and they say, oh, you know, you, you do, uh, you've got in-memory computing, you do machine learning, ah, it looks like Spark, you know? I'm already using Spark, why would I want to use this? But the thing is, there is an important difference as well. You know, Ignite does transactions, it does persistence, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system, it, yes, it's key value as well, there's a whole range of other things that it does. It, it behaves more like a, 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 you know, a grid or a database system, a distributed database system, because you want to use it that way. And the key thing, it works well with these other technologies as well. So it integrates with Spark, Flink, and so on. It doesn't try to replicate what they do well. If they do a good job for what they do, it complements them. Um, and it works in other scenarios as well. For example, I, I mentioned the ability to integrate with things like uh, MySQL, Postgres, acting as a caching technology. So the messaging that you'll often see there is the no rip and replace. Okay, so that's kind of important because one of the things that I found is that often in life, you know, organizations will have systems, they'll have data. Uh, these things have value. They have business value. They need to keep that for some period of time until, you know, some technology comes along that maybe enables them to replace those systems, perhaps because they're hitting some performance issues or uh, it, it becomes too old. Uh, years ago, for example, when I worked in my first job uh, in IT, I worked for Reuters, okay, and uh, I joined thinking I'd be working on the latest and greatest technology. The what they got me working on was PDP 11s. You know, these things were old when I joined. Um, and these things had switches and eight inch floppy disks. But the thing is, it, the technology worked. It did its job well. It was fine tuned, the hardware was fine tuned, and there was business value in there. So that's why they kept it. And you know, they, eventually it got replaced. I think you know, by the time I left, a few years later, it was all gone. Um, but you know, sometimes there's a, there's a need to maintain these things. So I, I would suspect there is probably some overlap. Uh, but I don't know enough about uh, uh, you know, uh, Apache Arrow to be able to give you... I think it's mostly for infrastructure. Oh, okay, understood. Okay. And, and does it do the streaming as well? I mean, can you use it for that kind of capability? I think it's, uh, I think it's still very much in the early stages. Okay. Uh, it's the same you have to comp it complement the budget part. You know, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Understood. Great, great point. Uh, all right, guys, uh, where's Tatiana? So, there you are. Um, uh, let, let her do the draw, okay? All right, guys, because we, 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 we need to vacate by eight, so we've got a little bit of time, so if she does the draw, uh, I think both